Hi everyone, I hope that you guys are all doing well. Welcome to episode 8. Here we go. Okay, let me just type in. Alright, let me just type this in the comment and then we will be ready to go. Okay, I see Alison is here. Alison, just give me a second. I just got to pin this comment quick, which is one of the hardest things to do. But anyway, okay, I'm ready. Let's do this. Hope you guys enjoy the show. Okay, just connecting. Alison, I can see you. And now? I, I can see you. Can you see yourself? No, I can't see my phone. Really? Yeah. Still, two weeks in a row. Oh my goodness. Okay, but I can yeah. see you and everyone else can see you. Um, do you want to quickly just try rejoin again? Yeah, let's just okay. try to rejoin. Okay. All right. Let's try that. Welcome, guys. Um, oh, getting some love already in the comments. Okay, let's try again with Alison. Just let's hold thumbs if this works. Almost there. Okay, we're waiting. I hope you guys are excited for the show. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be amazing. Um, yeah, I'm still struggling a little bit. Let's try it one more time. Okay. It says connecting now, so hopefully that's a good sign. Still can't see anything, but... Oh, my goodness. Okay. <laughs> okay. As um, long as you can see me. Can you, like, see me? I can see you. It's clear... Um, and I'm just going to ask people who are watching in the uh, on the live if they can confirm that it is clear that they can see you and me, both of us at the same time, um, before we get kick started. So someone just comment that you can see us both, and then I'll be ready to go. I can see a lot of hearts, but no comments. I need the comment <laughs> to carry on. Guys, can you see? <laughs> okay, so I, I'm getting feedback that, yeah. we, that they can see. All right, cool. And yeah, some, some really lovely compliments for you there. Alison, how are you? I'm nervous, but I'm good. How are you? I'm good. If, it's any, if it makes you feel any better, this is my eighth one, and I still get nervous <laughs> each and every single time. So... Yeah, we we both in that territory today. But thank you for um, coming on to the show. I know you were on the show last week, but um, maybe just to kickstart, you know, for anyone who didn't catch you last week um, as part of episode seven with the listeners, briefly just introduce yourself. So tell us, you know, where you're from, what you do, and what you're passionate about. Okay. So I'm Alison Melindy. I'm 22. I'm from Cape Town, from Kylie Cha. I'm currently in my final year of study, industrial psychology and social development. Awesome. And yeah, I'd say that's it. That's awesome. So something, so something new, which I'm doing um, in this particular episode, starting it now, but we're going to carry on doing it you know, further. But, you know, just a couple of questions just to get to know you a little bit better. Um, so the first one is, you know, so tell us what's your daily routine. So what's a, what's a typical day in Alison Melindy's life? <laughs> On a good day? Yeah. I wake up after nine. So I, mm. I do intermittent fasting. So I eat on a 16, eight hour, 16. And, and then I fast for 16 hours. I eat for eight hours. So when okay. I wake up, I'll normally have a black cup of coffee. And then I'll try to have quiet time. And then when I'm done with that, I'll exercise so that by 12 o'clock, I'm done eating, quiet time, exercise. And then I can eat off the top because that's outside of my window. That's when my window starts. So that's right. what it's, it's working up. It's having coffee. Mm -hmm. It's doing quiet time. It's exercising. And then it's eating lunch, which is also breakfast. Okay. And then it's getting my day started. So it's catching up on lectures, assignments, mm -hmm. what, whatever I need to do. And basically cool. that's my day. So are you are you a morning person, evening person? What kind of what kind of person are you basically? I would say definitely I'm a morning person. 
I feel oh, like yeah, I get sure. a lot done in the morning, then the evening. But yeah, definitely, I'm a morning person. Look, there's there's not a lot of us, unfortunately. Morning people <laughs> left on this. <laughs> not like there's such a few. Very few of us. So, so you know, so once restaurants open in in South Africa, um, what's the first meal that you're gonna have? What what meal are you craving? I've already eaten it. <laughs> it was McDonald's. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. That didn't, that didn't take long. Okay. <laughs> Literally, when it when the food like when was the delivery and everything mm-hmm. opened, since they don't deliver in the town shop, my mom's a okay. healthcare worker. She works at the hospital, so we got food delivered to her, and then she brought it home. Okay. <laughs> I love that. I love that. So, Alison, um, let's let's talk a little bit about you know your, yourself. So, I know you're running for for Miss South Africa 2020. Um, you know, I just want to ask, you know, why why are you running first of all and why now actually? You know, Miss South Africa over the years has evolved, eh? It's no longer just mm. about beauty, but it's become a platform where women actually they get to voice and speak on opinions that, you know, things that are close to their hearts. It's not just about mm. beauty. It's platforms that actually empower women and I feel like it's really changed from being what people had previously perceived it to be into something that people actually want to do to be on those platforms to have their voice heard but also that being said is that at the end of the day there can only be one Miss South Africa but it doesn't yeah. mean that those people who aspire to that can never do anything bigger if that makes yeah. sense. because yeah, also for yeah. me I knew that this year specifically when I entered I felt like I was ready to enter because I feel like I have a lot of experience and things that I've been through and views that I can actually contribute to the Miss Africa mm-hmm. brand to the platform but also mm-hmm. just you know there's so many people as well the entry is closed on Sunday and there were 2538 people that applied wow right and a lot of people and they're only going to be 35 semi finalists and then i don't know mm-hmm. how many finalists that will announce and for me it was very important to know that when i enter whenever next year would it would be next year the year after that i was actually ready because i feel like it's not the end goal miss africa is never a be or in end all because there can yeah. only be one winner but making sure that you actually true to yourself and what you want to do so i was ready to do that because i know that outside of Miss Africa my purpose still exists yeah I'm yeah still yeah thing to do things that is not the end or I'm sure it's a platform that can amplify your voice for the things that are close to your heart but also it's not the end or be or because also after you have rain there is life so for me yeah. it was I'm ready I'm ready because That's... I know what I'm doing I'm still committed to what I want to do it's not just you know some people say oh it's about the fame and everything i'm like no guys it's never about that because remember mm. not if what it is will win but if your heart is in the right place then you are set to yeah. do great things regardless whether or not yeah. you actually have a side effect and that is me i was ready my heart is ready my mind is ready and yeah that's why i decided to do it this year yeah i love that i love the fact that you know you you say that your your purpose still exists right independent of this this is a platform yeah. through which your purpose can manifest so it's, you know When when you win, not if. When you win, what do you hope to achieve? I hope to actually show people that you know, Miss Africa is not just a platform for people who are known, because a lot of people mm-hmm. think that it's only for certain type of people that people, a girl next door, can't enter and do it, and that's yeah. a stereotype that I think they on the right track to break, and that it can be a girl next door. I mean, look at Zuzi, grew up in the Eastern Cape, and now she's Miss yeah. Universe. You know, what I mean, it's yeah. it's become accessible to people, young girls aspiring to be, you know. better than whatever they come from these circumstances and i think that's also very important is to show people that it doesn't matter where you come from but also i think in this time that you know the coronavirus is here to stay for a mm. long time until there's a cure and yeah. i think using all that knowledge and how we can actually move south africa forward i mean i'm studying social development it's something i'm actually passionate about volunteering working with people and i actually want to use my platform to do projects that are close to my heart raising awareness about issues that are actually burdening children our welfare system yeah. and how we can move forward you know yeah. i'd rather want to be someone who has an impact that is sustainable rather than influence because influence comes and goes it's sometimes not even sustainable but impact can be measured and can be sustainable and that's uh, that's what i want to be about is sustainable impact and also bring other people along on the journey because i mean But some people I didn't even know message me and you inspired me just by entering and that for me is is enough is enough because now yeah. someone out next to me yeah. will for their dreams 
they wouldn't be scared mm. because they saw someone else do it and they believed they could. They saw a girl and they still do yeah. it. So they could. And that for me is very yeah. important to know that I, you know, you can do that because that's what social catalysts do. We can never do change by ourselves, but to bring other people yes. along and bring other people along who then create a catalyst of change. So I feel like that's, you know, that's really what I'm about is bringing other people and showing them that, hey, you too can make mm-hmm. a difference and more people are on the journey. So, you know, I aim to actually lead by example, which is what yeah. is something we really also just emphasize. Yeah. It's the power of your story, right? It's the power of, of your example, actually, mm-hmm. that, that will inspire people. So yeah. you've linked yeah. this a little bit to purpose, right? So let's, let's, let's dive into purpose a little bit. Okay. So what do you understand your purpose to be? If I had to ask you a very different question, I don't even know how I would answer that question. But yeah. what would you understand your purpose to be, one? And two, how has that sort of evolved over time? Has it always been, you know, I've, I've always known what my purpose is since I was eight. And, you know, I woke up one day and I realized this is my purpose. Oh, yeah. Or is it something that's still sort of evolving as you go along? I think it's something that still evolves, but there are certain elements mm-hmm. that say consistent. So for mm-hmm. me, I know my purpose has always been working with people, communities, and children, because yeah. I'm very much want to bridge gaps of inequalities wherever I can, given a platform, given, you know, the opportunity, I want to be able to actually fight for people who can't fight for themselves. So I really yes. know that my purpose would, in that sphere would obviously evolve as years go along, but it would be yeah. the main concept would be bridging inequalities. And then after yeah. that, it can evolve. But also another component of my purpose is actually uplifting women through yes. faith. So women mm-hmm. making, you know, then see themselves as Christ sees them, not defining them by their circumstances, what they've been through, and actually just empowering them to be who they aspire to be in Christ. I feel like that's also another one of my purpose is actually yeah. just empowering young women to actually see themselves as not as their past, but as, you know, who they mean to become yeah. in Christ. Like, yeah. 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 That's an excellent answer. Absolutely incredible. So tell me two or three, you know, so obviously that journey, that journey yeah. towards both discovering, finding and becoming what you want to be within yeah. your purpose, aligned with your purpose has come with lots of lessons and lots of principles that you've learned. Let's talk about two or three. So two or three key principles that you've learned in this journey, right, on your way to finding your purpose. That I feel like for me, we make purpose such a thing that seems bigger than what it is, if that makes mm-hmm. sense. So we make it seem as if it's something that's so far-fetched where it could be yeah. something that's right in front of you, but because yes. you're not open to that, you just, mm-hmm. you leave it. And that for yeah. me is very important to actually, you know, finding your purpose could be what do you enjoy doing? You know, yeah. sometimes yeah. your purpose scares you. I feel, feel that also when you know your purpose mm. scares you because it's something, you know, that's bigger than yourself, but it's right in front of you. So for me, it yeah. was actually knowing your values, knowing who you are, and then afterwards mm-hmm. throwing away your fears of why you can't be who you want to be and achieve what you want to achieve. So that for that's me really is throwing nice. away your fears believing in yourself, but also remembering purpose cannot exist outside of who you see yourself in Christ because he gives us purpose. So for me, it's also knowing who are you and what you actually, you know, who are you at the core? Not what do people see, but who are you, you know? So for me, throw away your fear, believe in yourself and chase your purpose. You can never ever achieve anything in life if you don't chase it. You have to really be committed to pursuing whatever is on your heart and yeah. That's absolutely incredible. That is so profound. And yeah, wow. That's a, that's a really, really profound answer. So what would you say to someone who hasn't discovered their purpose, um, you know, or is on the journey towards, you know, trying to discover their purpose, but doesn't know what it is? How do you find it? How do you know what it is? You know, for me, first, I would say step number one is sit down with yourself and think if you could do anything, what would you do? Outside mm. of people actually telling you what you should do and what yeah. outside of what you think you can't achieve. That's the yeah. first step. Once yeah. you sit down, you begin to align those, whatever you've jotted down with, what are you passionate about? And then you can mm. actually find things that actually overlap. And mm. after that, you begin to throw away your fears. So why can't you do that? Yeah. Why well, yeah. can't you throw away all those fears? And then also take steps to actually achieving that goal. Okay, mm-hmm. I can do this and this. Is it reading more to f- actually find out about a certain component? And then commit mm-hmm. yourself to doing that because I feel like yeah. you can never discover your purpose unless you actually dedicate yourself to actually pursuing 
finding out your purpose if that makes it's not just something yeah. that will appear out of nowhere you know it's yeah. it's reading praying it's meditating it's finding out who you are you see you find out who you are will help you mm. find out what your purpose is because it's at the core of who you are and not what people think you should be doing yeah. so yeah that's really good that's really really good i don't know if you can see the comments but you're getting a lot of love yeah. in the comments I don't know if you can see them, but there's, <laughs> no, just so, there's, just, there's just so many compliments here. Like people are, very, <laughs> people are quoting you here and everything. Which is so. <laughs> you must keep this quote and send it to me. <laughs> <laughs> no, don't worry, I'm, 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 I'm recording the screen, so I'll, yeah. the as well. I'll show you what they look like as well. So let's, let's talk about taking up space, right? Yeah. So what do you understand this principle to mean? What does it mean to you? What does taking up space mean to you? Yeah, that's actually a very good question. For me, taking up space is an important concept of putting yourself in spaces where people thought that you don't belong. Yeah. So it's taking yeah. up spaces with it in corporate, it be in like social settings, in social spaces where mm. people think that you don't belong. Taking up space on basis that you actually do belong there. You've worked hard to be there, and yeah. to be in positions where there's not representation of people who look like you would do what you do yeah. that is taking us is putting yourself in spaces where people think you don't belong but you do belong that is taking up space and that's why that's i feel right. like it's also yeah. very important for women to also take our space in corporate in social settings in whatever yes. sphere that you're in take up space because those are spaces that we too are qualified because women we are backbone of the economies without the economy Absolutely. it doesn't run society that's cannot right. find our woman and that's how we need to take our spaces in spaces where they say we can't take our spaces we need to really be at the forefront of actually pushing through this barriers because i mean we have children coming behind us that we actually have to think about take up space mm -hmm. in those fears so we get to a point where it's not she's the first you know qualified engineer in this position the first lady in this position the first day we just be like oh she's in that position and that's why we take up space so our children mm -hmm. don't have to fight the battle of they are the first they are the first yeah yes. Yeah, that's that's really good. So let's let's marry the two principles. So you know, taking up space and leadership. How do the two link in your mind? You know, leadership is you. Women are leaders. I feel like you know. I don't know if you know Zuzi. You know, yes. and mm. women are often not thought about to be leaders. We're not given the opportunities. But I mm -hmm. feel like taking up space and leadership go two and two together because yeah. leadership is very very important to have women in leadership because yeah. we're not given those spaces to actually be in leadership therefore taking mm -hmm. our space allows us to be closer to opportunities where we can be put in power positions of mm -hmm. power making decisions that show that hey we actually we are capable because people don't believe in females yeah they don't believe that women can actually take up space they can't mm -hmm. be leaders we can be leaders and that's the opportunity of taking our space take up space so we too can also be at the top of corporate ladders being leaders in whatever mm. spheres that you're in so i feel like yeah. taking up space and leadership are almost the same but they're not the same yeah 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 so how how important do you think representation is in <sighs> in the different industries right how how important do you think that 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 factor is actually in in the different industries yeah. very because you know children cannot model what they do not see So if they don't see yeah. someone from their background from who look like them who study what they study a female mm -hmm. in that space they can't mm -hmm. replicate what they do not see that's why representation is so important you cannot aspire yeah. to something that is not there so it's very important that we actually are represented as women in spaces that are filtered with men you mm -hmm. know we actually need to actually be there because you cannot model what you do not see that is yeah. just plain and simple you, you it, it becomes something of you know imaginary And we mm. actually need to make it a reality where you see someone be like, oh, there's a woman, you know, she's on the leadership board. I can do that. Mm. I can't, you can't just aspire mm. to something you don't see in your mind. Yeah. It becomes a point of, I'm not good enough. I can't do that. I can't do that. But when you see someone in that position, it becomes, there is representation. I can do that. I can be mm. that person. And I feel like it's very important to see someone representing you in a space that you want to be in because it gives you courage to also pursue your dreams regardless yeah. of what people may say because the representation is in this so representation is very 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 important mm, yeah. i love that so let's let's switch that around a little bit right so you you've taken up space you've got into the industry or the society or whichever sort of section mm -hmm. right that you've taken up space what level of responsibility and influence or influence do you have to help other people take up space in the future generations 
I think we have a big responsibility because I mean, even you being there, taking up space, you didn't get there on purpose. You yeah. didn't get there easily. So therefore, mm-hmm. it's very important that when you are there, cement yourself, make it yeah. known that you are there, but also make yeah. it known that you never ever want people coming behind you to be the first. You want it to be something that's actually, oh, there's another woman here. It's not yeah. just, oh, she's the first one. Because we are yeah. trying to break down those barriers that when people come behind us, it's yeah. not just, you know, it's, it's a bit easier because it's hard being a woman in, in spaces where you feel like you don't belong, where there isn't representation. Mm-hmm. So that's a very important in actually paving ways for people that come behind you, whether that mm-hmm. be through mentoring people in whatever sector that you're in, reaching yeah. out to organizations that actually help empower people to get into certain sectors. It's very important to have a give back kind of hot when you're in those spaces because there's a lot mm-hmm. of experiences that you've learned that people can actually learn from. And that's mm-hmm. very important because it also allows them to then begin teaching other people. And that's how we create yeah. social change. That's how we become catalysts because you can never do it by yourself. You need to bring yeah. other people along on the journey. Yeah. 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 Bring people with you. That, that's amazing. That's really, really good. So let's talk a little bit about this concept in a racial context. And I know, mm-hmm. you know, this past week, you and I have chatted offline um, about this particular topic that we're going to talk about now. And, you know, every, a lot has been happening sort of in, in, this con, in this context of the conversation in the past week. But let's, let's bring it home, right? So describe your experience to me um, in the racial context, particularly um, being a black girl in a private school, which is majority white. Uh, let's talk a little bit about your experience in that field. Oh, that's a very tough one. But, mm. you know, for me, I feel like it was also very hard because I was a black kid. I was on a scholarship and an all-white mm. school. Representation mm. was very minimal. Yeah. There were about seven people, black people in our grade out of about 100 people. We had yeah. one black people in the entire school. And that for me was very hard because I felt like I was always in spaces where I had to prove my worth. So I had to mm. overwork in order to be just looked at, not even recognized, but looked at. And that for me was heartbreaking because I hated, to be honest, first two years of school, I hated it. I wanted to leave. I thought of transferring, but I couldn't because I was on a scholarship. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I eventually got to the point, I was like, you know what, let's buckle down and get this done because this is also an opportunity that I would have never, um, a lot of people don't have, and I can't waste it, you Mm -hmm. know. So I was Mm -hmm. like, you know what, let me buckle down, let me do it. But it wasn't easy because... I knew that the only way to survive was to get involved. So it became involved yeah. in culture, became in sports. I mean, I was a provincial player for Nepal. I had colors. And yeah. that for me was also a very hard aspect because it's always sometimes it's people like, oh, you're just a quota. You're just a mm. quota, you know? And that for me was very heartbreaking because I'd worked very hard to be yeah. recognized and to actually get into problems. It's not easy, especially coming from the southern suburbs. It's a very, very, very hard. So I always felt yeah. that I had to prove myself. I, you know, I always had to defend that. Oh, no, I'm actually, I can, I know how to play. It's not just, I'm not in a team just because of quota. I, I'm actually mm. capable of playing. Whether it be mm. in academics, where you had to work 10 times harder to not be overlooked. Let me speak about social settings. You just get children who make you feel unwelcome. Like they give mm. you those looks when you sit to them at break. You just know that you can't sit at certain places, certain, certain, certain groups at well because they're just like, what are you doing here? You don't belong here. And they just make it known. They might not say it, but you feel it. And that is mm. the most painful thing because you can't do anything about it because when you complain, you get labeled as a trouble. Trouble. Yeah. I did that. I would... I complained before that, hey, we actually are facing this and this. And we actually get labeled, no, you actually, they try to hush, hush these situations. Mm. And that's because this happens all over. It's not just my school. It happens at most C model yeah. private schools in South Africa. It's, it's the yeah. same concept. We, people of color are constantly bullied. We feel like we're not enough. I mean, I had this inferior, infer, felt inferior most of the time where I felt like I was never enough. And that plays a huge role when I left high school. I mean, when I got to varsity, oh my word. Like mm. it was horrible because I always felt what I did was never enough. Yeah. Because that's a concept I took with me from high school into varsity that whatever I did was not enough. I always mm-hmm. had to work 10 times harder. And that never works. In varsity, it doesn't work. You need to be in your own lane, focused on your own thing. If you start comparing yourself to other people, you get distracted. And that's what happened to me. I started comparing myself to other people because mm-hmm. 
that's what I was used to from coming back from high school. I used to compare mm-hmm. myself, right, the rest according to other people. And that messes you up in the long run because you actually begin to find your worth in what people say, mm-hmm. how you people you how they validate you and that mm-hmm. okay if i don't achieve this certain level of marks i won't be validated because that's what i did in high school in order to be validated i had to achieve this when you get vast you nobody cares you're in your own lane you're doing your own thing but mentally mm-hmm. you're not there you haven't shifted yeah. out of the mentality of oh my word i actually need to shift out of that mentality this is not about them it's about me you know mm-hmm. for me that was very very hard and you know it's something that did affect me because i mean i was studying something i didn't want to study my first year Yeah. And that was also a challenge on its own because I was now trying to find what I wanted to study, but I was also mm. being influenced by my my mentality from high school of what yeah. I thought I would do to be recognized, you know? Yes. Yeah. 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 So it still follows through even into university. Mm. Yeah. Tell me in terms of, you know, did what if in today's time now now given what you know and given sort of the realization of you know how difficult that system was but also how in- unjust that was right yeah. what would you do differently if you went back um you know if you had to rewind you know back to 2011 when you started the school what would you do differently i think definitely representation is something that needs to change not just my school but across all C model schools where it be yeah. we actually intake more people of color we hire more people of color in teaching that's mm. very important because yes. as learners mm. we want to see people that look like us teaching in those spaces because they are qualified teachers that can actually teach you know what yes. i mean so i mm. feel like that's something they need to look at boards need to be represented representing us you know we need yeah. more people on boards that look like us that actually have our interests at heart we need to yeah. be asked what we want we can't just yeah. be saying oh no let's get these people in and then ask them ask us first you know as much yeah. as you want to lead listen to what the people you are leading want that's very yeah. important you can't just put it out there and expect us to just take whatever you give us without asking us and when you ask us implement what we suggest don't yeah. just ask us and then have us Not put our, in our heart into things and then leave yeah. it you know what i mean so for me it actually be like ask the students what they want and actually take them seriously because i feel like we mm. we don't get taken seriously students don't get taken seriously it's just mm. okay let's just ask them so they feel that we've included them yes. but actually have you actually listened to what we said yeah yeah that's the you haven't listened to what we said you've just you just merely asked. had a conversation so you can say you did something yeah you know yeah Yeah. yeah, there's a very big difference. So there's a big difference. There's a very big difference between actually taking students seriously and implementing and mm. just listening, you know? Yeah. So for me, it would be representation in teachers. It would yeah. be boards. Make sure that boards are actually, you know, they represent us. Yes. Intake mm. of students. That mm. is something that also needs to be looked at. As well as mm. policies that govern the school. It goes from uniform, it goes to hair. I mean, it's yeah. unacceptable that students of, you know, color cannot have braids or natural hair. Yeah. You know? But then you get people who are not of color can go and dye their hair, but nobody says anything. And when we want to ask questions, they say, mm-hmm. oh, no, but it's, it's their hair. It's not their natural hair. So I know mm-hmm. black is the natural color, but if they can't stick to their natural hair color, surely we can also dye. We can have different color. We can have our natural hair. Yeah. That's the also one, natural hair. Yeah. You know what I mean? Exactly. So keep the same yeah. energy across the levels. Don't be biased towards certain race groups. because that's what happens they are biased towards other people if you can come back from holiday with red hair and i can't mm. come back with braids that are ombre who must really? take off their braids who must dye their color yeah you know what i mean yeah. that's like just having the same consistency among learners because that's mm. also where the cracks show that it's unequal that's the first crack that it's, it's unequal that we are treated as if we are just you know afterthought and that's not what we want to a system we want to be in especially for our kids that are coming behind us because a lot of people mm-hmm. are like fine how about we just take away these scholarships at these schools and i'm like no that doesn't solve anything we have a very unequal education system in south africa mm-hmm. unfortunately the truth is that these schools do provide good education i'm not going to lie yeah. but it's never worth the expense of the health of your child yeah it's and the self worth right and the self worth and the self worth because those takes yeah. it takes years to undo i mean i'm still undoing it i'm a chocolated 2016 i'm still undoing all the effects that i faced mm. it's never worth it because also mm. 
We want to our children to be in environments where they feel that they can actually grow. They don't have to silence who they are. They yeah. can develop in their full potential because, I mean, these are prime years in our life. We want to have the best memories of learning. And we don't want to now look back and the only thing we remember is how we never felt included, how we always felt excluded. And yeah. for me, I believe this starts at home because, I mean, these children just don't wake up and come to school treating us like that. It's yeah. something that's taught at home. And I feel like yeah. it needs to be uprooted from the core, which is at home. How do you treat yeah. people? How do you treat your workers? That's also yeah. a first step. If you do not first respect step, yeah. your workers, how mm-hmm. are you going to respect students that represent and look like your workers at school? Yeah. You know what I mean? So it starts yeah. at home. It starts at home knowing that, yeah. hey, this is how you actually treat someone. Mm-hmm. And you don't do this and this. So that for me is also very important. It started at home. As much as we say policies need to be implemented, those also need to start at home. You yeah. need to start teaching your children how to respect people that are different to them. Yes. Yes. That needs to start at home because that adds on to everything else that we face. Yeah. That's really good. That's really, really profound and really, really wise. Um, so you and I are alumni. We, we're out of school. We are, you know, we 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 passed we passed that that stage now. We tricked. We've written our exams. We've gone to university, right? What role and responsibility do we have to make sure that this doesn't happen again, right? What can we practically do? So, as alumni, as people who've left the system but have realized the injustices of the system, what role and responsibility, both of those? do we have to help to make sure that the next black child who comes into that system doesn't go through the same thing, doesn't have to assimilate to feel welcome, doesn't have to, you know, change who they are to feel like they belong. What do we do? I feel like that starts with us, people that have left in speaking Mm. out, because I feel like, Right now, we were at a stage where we didn't know any better because a lot of us, when we endured all of this, it was kind of like we weren't, I don't know, they call us the woke generation. We weren't woke at that time. Mm. So I feel like for us, now that we know better, we do better. So we mm. actually begin to speak out on these injustices. We become a voice for people who are still silenced because the yeah. fact is that people that are still in these schools are scared to speak out because Absolutely. they know they're going to face discrimination. They're going to face mm. possibly disciplinary actions. Mm. But it's, it's on us to actually be like, you know what? This child is not telling lies because it's also another thing. People think that this is all made up yeah. until someone also says, actually, no, that happened to me. So there's actually power in sharing your stories because then it yeah. brings other people to also come to the platform and actually share their stories. That's and in us sharing our stories, take mm-hmm. action to actually wanting to see change. And that calls upon your know, policies to be changed. How do we actually start a dialogue of actually really listening to students, not listening, but yeah. listening to students? What is happening? Not just shoving it out of the carpet, but what is actually happening? It starts with us because we want to send our children to these schools that provide yeah. good education. Yes. But at the mental health, at the expense, we don't want to do that. So I feel like it starts with us speaking out on things that have happened and us actually going forward and speaking about these things to people who are in positions of power. And a lot of us now that have left, we are actually pushing forward in society, studying certain things. Let us mm. use our power and spaces of influence in whatever professions we are in to actually change the systems. If you're yeah. a lawyer, you need to actually change the systems of how, you know, schools are operating policies. If you're in yeah. development, look at actually how you can actually focus in building into those groups. So it also yeah. comes, we also have a part to play, not just the schools we're into, but in society in general, in reshaping, yeah. reforming how things were done before and not just, you know, what what exists we need to look beyond that how can we change it so that our kids don't yeah. face it within policies in the school but within the spaces yeah. that we are going into yeah 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 that's really really profound and i think you know i love the part where you where you spoke about the fact that you know we 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 that have left school have acquired certain skills or are studying certain things and we can use that, right? We have yeah. the responsibility to use that to make sure that the next generation doesn't have to go through the same thing that we went through. And exactly. I think it's it's that sort of call to action that that made, that's quite meaningful. And I think we've already seen this past week how meaningful that call to action can be, yeah. right? But also creating the safe space, right, mm, for black children to be themselves, to mm. be 
to be well, wholeheartedly who they are and not mm. have to feel as if they have to change themselves or oh, change yeah. who they are just so they can feel good, right? I think you're quite right. We do have that, that level of responsibility. So one of the questions that uh, came from the Q&A is, you know, what is your approach to abolishing systemic racism? So I know we've touched a little bit about that in the yeah. school context. But now let's let's talk a little bit broader, right? So what would be your approach? And again, difficult question, right? <laughs> Not an easy one to answer. But what what would be your approach? I think, you know, for me, policies. Policies mm-hmm. need to be rechanged because those policies are the ones that oppress people and keep those in power in power. And by changing those policies, we actually give power to those who don't have power and actually begin to create the to actually, you know, put the balance right, you know. Yeah. So for me, be looking into policies in these institutions of policies of inclusion. So how do you actually admit students? You know, do yeah. away with this quota thing and actually admit students on merit at yeah. being boards. Throw that away and actually get boards that represent people. Mm. You know what I mean? So it starts yeah. in the policies. It's not just something that happens overnight, but it's going to the root. It's going to the policies. How are these policies that are formulated actually beneficial to the people it's meant to serve? If it's yeah. not, throw it away and start it over. Actually include people when you're drafting those policies who understand mm. the implications mm-hmm. of what is being drafted in those policies. So don't just now, example, go and want to draft a new policy and exclude people of color or people who that policy is actually meant to help include different types of people to be a part of drafting that policy because yeah. that allows people to actually be like, actually, no, that's not right. That's mm-hmm. not right. But maybe let's go about it this way. And in that collective working together, we can actually form policies that will actually begin to dismantle systemic racism in institutions, in high schools, in workplaces, mm-hmm. in universities. So I feel like it takes a collaborative number of people, not just one person of one race of one. It takes different groups of people to actually come together and actually make suggestions yeah. to actually going yeah. to make a change. We cannot do it just by one person. We need everybody to actually come together and want to be part of the change. That's also another thing. It needs people who want to change because sadly mm-hmm. you can never be in a position of power and pass a policy and you don't want it to change because you're the person in power. You need to yeah. actually have a heart to actually, you know, what I'm, what I'm doing is wrong. I actually need to change. Mm-hmm. You know? So it starts at that what has been before is wrong and what you're trying to do to fix it is actually moving forward. Yeah. 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 And also yeah. the very important thing about policies is that you actually have to know policies, why they oppress people and why they are wrong for you yeah. to actually be committed to making sustainable change in that sphere. Yes. Once you can understand why it's wrong and just that you have to change it, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. and it's very important also for accountability. Mm-hmm. Another question that we had, oh, well, first of all, that was excellent answer, yeah. like brilliant, brilliant answer. Another question that we had was, you know, what is, what is your thinking on, you know, particularly your high school mates who are non, non-people of colour, um, who have been quite silent in this time? Um, mm. You know, how do you feel that they have a responsibility to speak out at the moment in this kind of time? What is your approach given your experience so given mm. what you went through how do you feel about those who are silent particularly non-people of color at, at this particular point in time well that's one's a very sensitive one but for me it's there's a lot of people white people at schools that the school that i went to and for them to be silent kind of puts a question in my mind of you know there's a difference yeah. between being silent and not knowing what to say. Yeah. Can I actually un- un- unpack that? You yeah, can be silent in the sense that you're just silent because you're like, okay, whatever that doesn't affect me, let it just pass. But yeah. then there's actually not knowing what to say, but reaching out to the people of color that you were friends with saying, hey, I, I, know I don't want to post on social media because that's also performative, you know, being mm-hmm. pretending you're standing with Black Lives Matter when you're not. But there's yeah. a difference in you actually reaching out to people of color that your friends are being like, hey, I, I don't know what to say, what to do, but I want yeah. to be involved in this conversation. I want to move this forward. I want yeah. to, you know, let's talk. How can I actually be a part? How can I confront racism in the circles that I'm in, whether it be family, be friends? You don't have to post about it, but going to the people that you were friends with before, yeah. that were close to you, that you actually really feel 
you know, that you were actually really, really, really friends with, going to them and being like, hey, I might have even had times myself that I, I've been racist towards you. I'm sorry, but I'm committed to making a change. And you don't have to post on social media, but be committed to actually reaching out and being a part of the dialogue. Because we don't need people who are pretending to stand, stand with us when they're not standing with us. But we need people mm-hmm. who are actually committed to having these hard conversations, to being involved in uprooting this. So that means for me, you don't have to post. You can simply message. I mean, I have a friend, I think she's on here, Alexia. She messaged me. Mm-hmm. We've been having conversations of what it actually is that we are protesting for, why we are speaking out, why Black Lives Matter. And that for me is the most important thing is friends who are willing to engage in this uncomfortable conversations or sometimes mm-hmm. where they have been perpetrated, where they didn't know it, but now they know. Because also when you correct people on things that they've done that were wrong, you need to tell them why they were wrong. Because yeah. if you just tell them, they will do that to someone else and not understand it. But once you begin to tell them why it was wrong, the next time they won't do it, they will actually mm-hmm. be stopped in their head but actually that is wrong because of this. And when they see someone else doing it or saying something that is wrong, they themselves mm-hmm. can actually be like, actually, what you said is very problematic and this is why it's problematic. And then yeah. the next time someone else does something, the yeah. person will also correct someone else. And that's how we keep it moving is that one person, you're able to call someone out for something and you know why you're calling them out. Yeah. And then they can also actually understand because no use telling us it's r- telling us telling you it's wrong and you're not yeah. knowing what's wrong. But when you understand why it's wrong, you're able to correct yourself, you're able to introspection and able to correct other people. So yeah. that's how Yeah. That's that's incredibly wow. powerful, right? Okay, no, that was excellent an excellent answer to I think a very <laughs> difficult question, right? Yeah. Um to first of all to to answer. Um yeah. Second of all, to hear, right? And third of all, to introspect, right? So, you know, where we stand on, on the one side of this. And I think, you know, what what has probably stood out for me about what you said is that, you know, there's a difference between not knowing what to say mm-hmm. and just deciding actually that doesn't affect yeah. me. So, you know what? It doesn't matter. Actually, it does, right? Every voice that is able to speak out against this contributes yeah. to the wholehearted strength of the movement to end systemic racism. Yeah. So I really love what you said. Okay, we're going to change the subject slightly. Um, there was a question as well, which asked, you know, how, how, well, first of all, part one of the question wasn't a question, it was a statement. It was, we love you, Alison. That was the one. That was part one, right? So part one was, you know, the person says, you're awesome. Okay. Part two is how do you stay so connected to God? How how has that been? How's that journey been for you? And practically, how have you stayed so connected to God? I feel like it's just intentionality. So for me, it's a fine because I mean, this right now is a very busy season for me as well. Mm. And I feel like in seasons, your way that you connect with God changes, but also you have yeah. to be adaptable to that. So yeah. for me, it's now it's times of like, okay, I, sometimes I can't even have the amount of quiet time I want to have. But then it's like, okay, I have podcasts that I'm subscribed to. Then it's playing mm-hmm. a podcast. Okay, if you're washing dishes, I'm playing a podcast. If yeah. I'm exercising, I'm doing a podcast. So it's actually finding intentional ways to actually still connect with God rather yeah. than saying, oh, I can't do this and this because I'm busy. So find yeah. other ways that you can oh. still stay connected. Quiet mm-hmm. time. It would be podcasts, it be, you know, worship music, it'd be playlists. I feel like it's on your side is intentionality of finding yeah. ways. Because also you must it's it, you know, someone once said that you you mustn't work around your schedule, you mustn't work your schedule around God, you must work your God or you mustn't work God around your schedules, but work your schedule yeah. around your time with God. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I feel like that's yeah. something that's very important. Put everything around that so wherever you can do it because i mean that's the fundamental part of your life because you i can easily feel when i'm disconnected like i can feel i'm tired i'm groggy i'm impatient um Mm. you know and that's when you just know that something's missing you know and i feel Mm. like it's also just knowing yourself but also knowing the presence of god in your life i feel like that's also one thing that will help you stay connected because as soon as you know the presence you immediately know when you're out of the presence. And that mm. just forces you as well to actually be like, no, actually I need to cut this out so I can be more intentional because I know his presence and his presence right now, it feels mm. so distant. But also sometimes is it you that's making it this, that makes it seem distant? Yeah. Because sometimes it's just 
he's there, but you haven't taken the intentionality to actually be like, I'm tired. Here I am. Yeah. And I feel like one thing I'm learning in this season is that mm. go to God with my problems as they are, because I mean, he knows everything before you say it, but like any other parent, he wants you to say it. Mm. So he knows when you're sad, when you're upset, when you're upset, go tell him, be like, God, I'm upset at A, B, and C. This is what happened. I'm not okay. I'm not going to pretend mm. I'm not okay, but my heart is breaking. Please, you know, heal me. Mm. And that's mm. I'm willing to be that vulnerable and actually just laying it there because often we want to yeah. pretend we're okay. Everything's rosy. But no, he's a parent. Like any other yeah. parent, they want to know yeah. when something's wrong. They know yeah. it, but they want you to actually come to them and be like, I'm hurting. Yeah. This is yeah. how I feel. No, and that's I feel like that's something we have to really mm-hmm. be as Christians willing to actually go and be like, This is how I feel. I'm not yeah. I'm not happy, I'm upset, but mm-hmm. this is how I feel. I'm not gonna sugarcoat it. So I feel like that's also, you know, something to awesome. actually think about. Yeah. Awesome. I'm gonna take one question here from the comments. Um okay. it comes from Ayanda, or at yeah. least the first part of uh, the username handles Ayanda and, and then underscore Yans. So <laughs> Ayanda says, I'm interested to know as a young lady, where do you get your drive to be able to impact the lives of young girls while on your own you've had a lot you've you've had a lot dealing with having to experience injustices, but you're content yeah. as well. So it's quite a, that's no, quite a lovely question actually. It's a very, it's two part question. Yeah. I feel like for me, I always have hope that there's going to be a better future. So I mm. feel like that hope is what drives me to actually be committed so that people yeah. behind me don't have to experience what I went through. If yeah. me sharing my story, my struggles can inspire other people and mm. have them not face what I face, then I'm going to go and put myself in the firing line so that others don't have to experience what I experience, yeah. and paving the way for those that are coming behind me, because I think that's very important. Paving yeah. the way for people who haven't, because opportunities that I've gotten haven't been by luck. I've had to work very hard for them. I've had to sacrifice yeah. a lot of things, you know, cried. There's so, so much I could say. Yeah. But I don't want people ever to feel like they cannot achieve their dreams because of where they come from. And that's why I put myself in the firing line for things. That's why I've even put myself out there for Ms. Essay because I need mm-hmm. people to actually know that your circumstances don't determine where you're going. Yeah. But that, that yeah. you can be the girl next door and aspire to things that seem so far fetched. Mm. Just be willing to commit yourself to doing that. And I think that's why Absolutely. I do it. Be willing to commit myself to something that will help other people as well see yeah. themselves where they are. So that's why I do it. That's incredible. Yeah. Incredible. Alison, thank you so much for coming on to the show, um, for being part of a, an impactful conversation. Um, I love your energy. Amazing, right? Like you just... <laughs> Like this was just such an amazing episode. I mean, we could we could do this forever, um, yeah. and we, we absolutely must do a part two, right? Yeah. So we we I think everyone who's who's watched this and who's going to listen to this either on the podcast or watch it on the YouTube channel has been really impacted by this stage, right? By the time they get here, I'm sure their mindset has been impacted. They, you know, I think feel inspired to take on the next week. So I just want to thank you for coming onto the show, um, for supporting the show, for watching, for listening. Thank you so much. All the best with your journey to Miss South Africa. Um, I look forward to watching you take first place. So all of the best (laughs) for that. But thank you so much for coming onto the show. Thank you so much for having me. I look forward to part two. And thank you to everybody who actually tuned in and actually was contributing and willing to have these conversations. Because, I mean, it's so easy for people not to be on here. They could be doing other things, but they want to actually be a part of actually making a change, being involved in this conversation. So that's also just thank you for actually wanting to be a part of change and actually yeah. being on impactful conversations so you can also just impact other people's lives as well. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, I love that. Love that. Yeah. Thank you, Alison. Have a lovely Thank rest you. of the weekend further Thank and you. all the very best for the journey to Miss South Africa. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Right, cheers. Bye-bye. Well, I hope that you um, enjoyed that, episode eight. Um so stay tuned for episode nine next weekend, which I'm really, really excited about, which is going to be awesome. And yeah, you can catch this episode. So you can catch this episode on the YouTube channel. 
Um, so if you search Impactful Conversations on YouTube, you'll find it there. And please subscribe to the channel as well. And also, if you don't like watching videos for a long time, you can catch this episode on Apple Podcasts or Spotify Podcasts. So search Impactful Conversations there. Hit subscribe or follow. So subscribe for Apple and follow for Spotify. And you'll get access to all of the episodes. You can download them and listen to them at your leisure. But until next time, until next weekend, I hope that you all stay safe, stay healthy, and bye-bye.